Uh, thank you very much uh, to GLC for, for inviting us. This is our second GLC event um, uh, this year, which is, which is awesome. Tiffany and I were both in Birmingham, um, where there was a GLC event held for, I think, over 80 students uh, from various uh, universities throughout the UK, and that was super exciting. Uh, I actually got to fly down to London and then make my way over to Birmingham to meet all the students um, over a couple of day period. So uh, it's always nice to meet in person, but these events as well, the online events are great because we have a greater reach here. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you for organizing Shora and everyone else at GLC. Um, I'll give you a very brief uh, you know, intro of what NCA Tutor is. Um, this, the company was founded back in 2012, so it's been over 10 years now um, that we've been offering uh, both study materials as well as courses for NCA exams. But beyond that, um, we also uh, provide instruction uh, our head division of the company is LexPD. We provide CPD courses, continuing professional development for lawyers. We're a pre-accredited society um, or pre-accredited CPD provider in BC. Uh, we also provide bar exam instruction and an amazing index, which Tiffany is leading a, a group of very talented law students um, from, from various universities, um, Canadian universities and non-Canadian. <clears throat> so we've worked with well over 2,500 students. I probably have to update these numbers from over 65 countries and uh, well over 10,000 students have used our study materials to assist them with their preparations. Um, and uh, you can see some of the images of some of our instructors here, uh, Alex, myself, Tabang, Ina, Sienna, and Tiffany. So I founded uh, LexPD and NCA Tutor. Um, I also run another uh, company, which is a cannabis uh, legal education, as well as alternative dispute resolution company. Um, I have an extensive background in the cannabis industry. I worked on the board of directors of a publicly traded company, uh, chaired the committee on corporate governance, um, and, and wore very a lot of hats in that company. Um, I've practiced in New York, uh, as well as Ontario. Um, currently my practice is in civil litigation. Um, and, uh, but teaching is, is take, occupies a majority of my time and what I do. Um, my backgrounds, I have a business background. Um, I did study at the University of Manchester. So I did go abroad and go through the NCA process myself. And um, I also left private practice in 2015 uh, to pursue a master's degree at the University of Toronto. I, much like Laren, I also went abroad. I did my um, LLB at City University uh, in the United Kingdom. I graduated, I did a two-year express degree and graduated in 2018. Um, I did the NCAs. It took me about nine months to do the NCAs. I did them while I was abroad in the UK. I was working for um, an insurance company at the time in, in sort of their regulatory and risk department, <clears throat> operational risk. Um, so I did the NCAs while working full time doing that. And then after I completed the NCAs, I went through the articling recruitment process um, and I had applied for LLM programs as well. Um, I kind of got simultaneously an offer for articling starting in 2020 um, and also an offer to do my LLM at NYU starting in the fall of 2019. So I flew off to, to New York to do a degree there and write the New York bar. <clears throat> I started articling in September 2020. Uh, and I am now still practicing, entering second year associate uh, at that firm, which is an insurance defense civil litigation firm. Okay, so what are the NCA exams very briefly? Um, most of you know this stuff, so we won't dwell too long, but open book exams, uh, which are pass fail, a passing grade, you need to achieve 50% on these exams in order to clear them. Um, for the most part, um, the exams are problem-based questions for most of the subjects, okay? 
But in some subjects, you may receive short answer questions. You may also receive essay questions. But for many subjects like administrative law, constitutional law, criminal law, even professional responsibility, a lot of the questions will be problem-based uh, tort law. Um, but then we have some hybrid type of exams with essays and, and short answers, of course, as well. Um, and in some subjects, there may even be multiple choice, um, multiple choice questions being asked, okay? The exams are entirely online these days. Um, so you're typing, you can take your exams from anywhere in the world. You do not have to be in Canada. You know, the subjects uh, that uh, you may be assigned or the core and mandatory subjects are seven, sorry, eight subjects rather. And they're on this left-hand column foundations, constitutional law, administrative law, criminal law, professional responsibility. These five subjects uh, you are unable to waive out of, meaning even if you'd taken these in law school, um, you know, in your, um, let's say, UK law degree, I know some universities offer Canadian constitutional law, you will still have to write these at the NCA level. So taking those courses at a UK university or in Australia, um, Bond used to have a special relationship with the NCA where you could have completed that degree there and then you didn't have to take any NCA subjects. That's no longer the case. So no matter what, you're going to have these five subjects. Now, the, also the mandatory subjects are contract law, property law, and tort law. But these ones you can be waived out of if you demonstrate competency in this. So if you've come from a common law background, which I assume many of you have, um, and you've performed reasonably well, meaning 5% above a passing grade in your law school, then you won't be asked to take these three subjects, unless, of course, you have poor performance in some other subjects, and you may get assigned one of these three in addition to the course you perform poorly in. The elective subjects are family law, evidence, business, commercial, civil procedure, remedies, taxation, trusts. For many of these courses, we have study materials available, as well as uh, lawyers practicing in various areas that can assist with a lot of these subjects. Some of them we currently don't have, but we are working a on a lot of new study materials for this year. Uh, the new requirement as of January this year, so some of you may have been assessed prior to January or received your assessment after January, but yet you were still under the old bracket because your files were, were hanging in, in the queue. Um, you'll note that there is a sixth mandatory course right now that has to be taken, and that is the legal research and writing requirement. Um, this can be fulfilled through a Canadian law school or through CPLED, which is partnered with the NCA to, to create this course. Um, the course is about eight weeks long. It's online entirely. There are four assignments being given to you. I believe the first two assignments are not graded, and the last two are, if I'm not mistaken. Um, CPLED has uh, a lot of information on this. They've, they've released, a, a, I think, a video recently, and they held a webinar on, on this, and I'm sure they're going to hold many more webinars. But it is a good course from the people that have taken it in the pilot program. Um, I did hear very good feedback, and I think it will help you with your exam writing. Uh, so if you do consider taking it, maybe one of the first things you should do is, is the CPLED course. Grading online exams has become much more efficient. There was this process of collecting the exam papers from all over the world, physically mailing them to an examiner who would have to mark directly onto your papers. And it was just, there were a lot of administrative tasks which were totally unnecessary. Now everything's digital, it gets sent immediately to the examiner who can grade them quickly and, uh, and get them back to the NCA efficiently. We don't need to mail stuff anymore. You can also go back to your answers as you're typing your, your exam. Let's say you finished early, 20 minutes early. You'd like to go back and read your answers. And, oh, you've noted that there's a mistake. You can delete and you can add information. That's a huge advantage over a written exam where, you know, you'd have to cross out what you've written find another place to write a new paragraph somewhere to squeeze in some information. It's really 
not conducive to correcting your own exam while you're in the exam room. So the online exams do bring a huge set of advantages. And the last one, you don't have to wake up super early. You can be in your pajamas, comfortable. Um, I find that constitutional law makes up a significant portion of other exams, right? A lot of constitutional law overlaps in administrative law, in foundations of Canadian law, in criminal law. A huge part of the criminal law syllabus deals with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So my recommendation is to take constitutional law as one of your first exams if, it, if your schedule allows for it. Um, I also strongly recommend that you do not take foundations of Canadian law until you have tackled administrative law and constitutional law first. Uh, again, administrative law makes up a significant portion of topic 10 on the foundation syllabus. And yet the syllabus and foundations of Canadian law doesn't do that topic justice. And you may be expected to write a judicial review problem on administrative law or even an essay question, an advanced essay question on administrative law. It certainly helps to know administrative law in great detail, which you'll learn in that course. Um, so my recommendation, strong recommendation, is to take Canadian constitutional and administrative law prior to attempting foundations, or at least at the same time. So as you're learning it, then you can tackle foundations. Foundations tends to be a tricky exam uh, for most people. Um, criminal law and professional responsibility in any order, but again, I strongly recommend constitutional law before criminal exams law. Exams are being offered every single month of the year, except I think December, they, they take a break. Um, and you have, um, you have subjects being offered sort of throughout that month. So the first weekend might be constitutional law that's being offered, uh, and you'll have like four different options. You can take constitution Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Uh, and you kind of pick the date that works best for you. Then the next week, you might take some, a different subject if it's being offered and you want to take it. Maybe it's administrative law and administrative law is being offered Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So you have a bit more time to breathe in between exams. You can kind of space your exams out um, a little bit. Um, the core exams, so those five mandatory subjects, are now all offered over the span of three months with elective subjects scattered in between. Um, so you will have... Um, you might have like constitution and admin being offered in January and then, um, you know, criminal and PR being offered in February and then March is the remaining subjects and then you have some electives in there as well. Um, so you could, if you wanted to really sit down and tackle this, you could complete all of your NCA requirements um, if you're if you're required to do like five to seven exams probably uh, within a three month period. If you're given more than that, it might take you longer, but the average sort of common law um, student is given anywhere between five to seven exams. So it is possible if you really hunker down and, and focus to do it in a three month time Elective frame. subjects, you need to be careful with them. If you're really set on doing family law, for instance, family law is only offered two times a year and that might be in February and it might be in October. You have to look at the schedule. Um, so if you can't write it in February, but you're really set on doing family law, you're gonna have to wait till October. So that's gonna slow down your timeline. Similarly, once you commit to an elective, if you don't pass it on the first try, you have to try that elective again. Once you've picked your electives, you are stuck with them. So if you try family law in February and you don't pass it, you're gonna have to wait till October to take it again. Even if you pass all the rest of your exams and there's like some other elective being offered in June that you'd like to take, but you've already committed to family law, they're not gonna let you switch into that other elective. They're gonna make you wait till October. So it's when you're planning out your schedule, just be aware of those factors. Pick electives that um, you know make sense to you. And when you're studying for electives, make sure you're not treating them as throwaway courses because they could delay your whole process if you don't pass them on the first try. So there are other factors to consider when you are building your exam schedule. Um, obviously your lifestyle and, and your background are going to be very important. If you are working full-time like I was, that's gonna slow down um, you know, how much you can reasonably do, whether you can kind of cram everything into three months or whether you need to spread out a little bit more. 
The other thing you need to consider is your language level. Um, you know, legal language, even if you're a native English speaker, can become sometimes convoluted and confusing. Um, and so if English isn't your first language, you may have to read things slower. You might have to take more time to study materials and understand them. Um, you know, it might, it might take you a bit more time to be comfortable with the level of academic writing you need to get to uh, to pass the exam. So only you can gauge that for yourself. That depends on everyone's own sort of um, level and it's just something to be aware of and to think about. And then obviously travel and space, you know, exams are being offered online so you can do them from anywhere. Um, but when you are doing the exam, you need to have a stable internet connection. You need to have a quiet and private space. You can't have people walking in and out of the exam room when you are doing the exam. So um, if your personal home doesn't offer that kind of space, you might have to go, you know, book a room in a library or book a conference room for yourself. So those are other things you're going to have to consider when you're planning your exam. You know, where are you going to be at that time you're writing the exam? Do you have the necessary space and an internet connection in order to do it? Um, study time will depend on your approach. So if you're reading through the whole textbook, I'm going to say it's going to take about six to eight weeks of studying you know, anywhere from 30 to 40 hours a week, you know, doing evenings and weekends. Um, if you're reading the textbook with study aids and notes, you can probably cut that time down a little bit just because you can kind of, you don't have to sit and struggle through the material as much if you have a study guide or some notes next to you that can explain things as well. Um, and then if you're reading just the study aids and notes, which I will note NCH does not formally recommend, you should have a copy of a textbook to aid your study. Um, you know, people can do it in one to two weeks. You know, you need to gauge how you study best um, and you need to gauge how, how much information you need to consume. The trick with the NCAs is making sure you don't overwhelm yourself. And there is a blog post about that on our, on our website. You know, it is very easy when you look at the syllabus. They give you the mandatory textbook. You should definitely read that. But then they also give you all of these other optional readings and people will get bogged down reading them. They're like long 40 page academic articles and there's like one for every section sometimes like for foundations is an example of that. They really give you a lot of materials. You don't necessarily need to read all of them or any of them depending on your comfort level. You know, if there's something you're not understanding or something that's not making sense to you in the textbook, it can be helpful to read some of the secondary materials, but they aren't necessarily required to pass the exam. Uh, and you don't want to just be absorbing all of this information and then not knowing how to process it or use it on the exam. You need to be very careful about how, how you are absorbing information and how much you are, you're trying to carry around with you. It is a pass fail 50% exam. You need to be reasonable on what you're studying. So my quick tips for success. Number one is don't freak out. These exams are really, really manageable. Um, like I said, they're 50% pass fail. Um, as long as you read through the materials and you know how to answer questions properly, which we'll get to at the end of this presentation, you can pass them. It's it's not it's not going to be. They're not hard in the sense that they're designed to trick you or make your life difficult. But if you have properly prepared for them, you will not have a problem passing them. Uh, plan ahead. You know, I already went through that. Make sure you've set out your schedule. Make sure you know what you're trying to do, what exams you're taking, which month. Make sure you have a very clear study plan for yourself. It will help you manage time. It will make sure that you get through this process as efficiently as possible. Um, if insofar as you can, I recommend aligning your NCA schedule with the art exam application deadline. So in Vancouver and Ontario, or sorry, British Columbia and Ontario, it's um, generally art exam recruitment for the following year with the most, the bigger firms happens in um, the beginning of July. If you can write on your cover letters that you are done the NCAs or, you know, one exam away from being done the NCAs, that's incredibly helpful um, because employers, you can't start articling until you pass the NCAs. That's like, you, you are not allowed to start an articling position and working towards the articling requirement um, until you have completed the NCAs. So, an employer who's offering you a place in their articling pool for the following year wants to make sure that come you know June, so let's say you applied this year and you got an offer, come June 2023, you can actually take up that role. And if you haven't successfully passed your NCA exam, you, you won't, and they will, then they'll have to scramble to try to find a student to replace. Uh, I touched on this before, but study smart. You don't need to read everything on the syllabus. You know, focus on the required readings and get study notes from a reputable source to help you do that. Um, obviously, I recommend NCA Tutor. I use NCA Tutor notes for most of my subjects. And then get organized, gather and organize your study notes. You know, I had tabbed binders when I went into the exams. I would have the, the tutor notes in like a tab with each chapter. I made like little mind maps for myself, you know, noting where all things were. 
organize yourself in whatever way works for you, but make sure you're organized and make sure that you can quickly access the parts of the materials you need to. You know, if you open an exam in criminal law and it's a question on, you know, um, a police officer who's a police officer who's accidentally murdered someone while you know in a high speed chase. There's a very specific section of the criminal code, and you will have specific notes on that sort of the the evaluation of that matter. If you can quickly flip to that in your notes, you're already way ahead because you don't have to sit there and think from scratch. You have a guide in the notes um, or in your personal notes on how to answer that question, and it's right there in front of you. It's just a matter of like following it and applying the facts and popping them in. So. If you can get your notes to a state where you can quickly find things in them, it will make your life a lot easier and it will make you feel more comfortable walking into the exam. That question comes up a lot when we do these kinds of exam, uh, these kinds of presentations. Um, Loren and I have a very, I think, similar perspective on it. If you are uh, capable, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, just like an entry point, and then I'll let Tiffany pick it up where she's about where she's about to start. First of all, you have to check what your assessment says. If your assessment says that you need to go to law school, you have no choice but to go to law school. Um, that would be the case if you do not have a qualifying law degree. Okay, if you don't have a qualifying law degree because your law degree has not met the criteria or you haven't achieved the minimum score necessary, um, then you need to often go to law school for an additional year or two years and you would have to apply to Canadian law schools if you're going to it through a JD program or in some cases you can apply for a master's program. It's a bit complicated when you need to do two years because you'd probably have to do two master programs. OK, I think it's much easier to simply go to another country and do a two year program. Uh, it's a lot cheaper for sure than doing two master degrees in Canada. Um, if the NCA tells you, OK, these are the these are the subjects you need to demonstrate competency in, you can fulfill those subjects either through writing NCA exams or through applying to a Canadian law school, that means as a JD student or a single course enrollment, or through a master's program as a master's student. Yeah, and so there are specific master's programs at a lot of law schools in Canada that are designed to help you go through the NCA process. Um, and a lot of times they're called like a common law um, master's program. I think UBC has one, um, U Ottawa, I mean, yeah, U Ottawa has one, um, Osgoode Hall has one in Ontario. I think there's, there's obviously ones in Alberta and other provinces as well. Um, so you, you, those are specifically designed LLM programs. And basically what they, what is in them is you go through all the core subjects of the NCA and then you pick some electives. And the problem with those LLMs from my perspective is that you are taking what are essentially JD courses. So, you know, there's Canadian constitution law is what like every first year law student takes when they enter a JD program in Canada. And you're paying graduate school prices and more than graduate school prices, a lot of times those programs are more expensive than just taking a specialized master's in business law or a specialized master's in um, health law or whatever, you know, sort of interest area you want to take. So you have to be very... Um, you have to sit and think about what your goals are. If you are someone who can self-study and you're comfortable doing that, then it's more economical to do what I did, which was self-study the NCAs and then take your LLM money and put it into an LLM that is actually going to give you a specialization. So I self-study the NCAs. It cost me at that time, I think something like $4,000 to do it all. Um, versus the twenty-eight to thirty-five thousand dollars U of T and Osgoode Hall were looking for to do an LLM, a common law LLM. So I saved a lot of money. I took those savings and then I put it into my master's program in New York, which got me an extra. I was able to write the New York bar off of it. I learned some American law uh, and I, I focused on technology um, and and I took a really cool course in like cryptocurrency and how you know the regulation of Bitcoin is not really as progressed as like the Bitcoin environment is. And, and you know, I wrote a really cool article on that, which ended up getting published. So you, you know, when I'm in an interview now, I can talk about that really cool course. And it's something that like 
far fewer people have done than Canadian constitution law. Um, when I'm in an interview, I'm not talking about how I did an LLM and I did constitutional law and contracts law and whatever. I'm talking about these other cool things that I did at, at, a, at a more specialized LLM. Uh, it wouldn't matter if it was in the US or if it was in Canada. Like if you take a specialized LLM, then you have specialized knowledge that sets you apart from other people in the application pool. So the answer to the question, you know, should I do my NCA self-study or should I do them through LLM? It really depends on what your goals are uh, and your study style. If you're a student who needs, you know, needs instruction and you like to have a, someone helping you and you like to have a professor in front of you, you know, teaching you the law, then obviously you need to go do it through a more formal program than the self-study. Um, so you kind of have to assess that yourself, but it is worth sitting down and saying, what are my goals and what do I eventually want to do in my career? And is, is it more worthwhile to do an LLM that is more specialized? Um, or am I not interested in ever doing an LLM? I'm literally just doing this to get rid of the NCAs and I'd rather have a professor. Well, then a common law LLM will make sense for you. I also add that we provide that structure in our courses and uh, our courses are designed not as yeah. a Canadian law school course where they're teaching you theoretical concepts, but we teach it as a prep course for an exam. And so we are specifically designed to preparing you to pass the NCA exams. And that's how we've structured it. And, uh, you know, we get students that, that, that have, you know, various responsibilities, but a lot of them are working full time and they can't dedicate the time to self-study. So they'll take our prep courses or their parents of young children, or they've got other obligations going on. So there are many reasons why people will come to us for classes, or they simply need that structure that Tiffany was talking about in studying and learning. Um, and so there are various pathways um, and uh, you don't necessarily have to spend 35 to 45,000 uh, which are what some of the programs cost. Um, I'll speak about my own experience very quickly. I went to U of T for a master's degree as well. It was not the global lawyers, uh, the GP LLM that they call. Um, I qualified in New York. I was a practicing lawyer. I had already qualified in Ontario and I got accepted to U of T and I got a full scholarship plus extra funding to go there. But I'll tell you my tuition was only $10,000. The global professional LLM is upwards of 40 something thousand dollars, I believe. Don't quote me on that. But, um, and you're taking first year law courses in, in that program. Whereas my LLM, I was allowed to take upper year, third year JD courses and select all the specialization, you know, specialized courses I wanted. Um, so again, so I streamed in business law. Um, and I did it for academic reasons, of course, I wanted to go into teaching uh, in more detail. So, so I had a reason to go in and, and do a master's program and, and I actually left private practice for that, but I didn't do it for the purpose of fulfilling my NCA requirement. Yeah, so the other thing I'll just add because it's come up in the chat now is the Alberta University ITLP, which is the Internationally Trained Lawyers Pathway Program they have. Um, Larena, you might know more about this than I do. I don't, it's not an actual LLM. I think it's just like a certificate program. It's not a degree, um, that's a, it's not a degree program. Sorry? Yeah, it's that's right. It's, it's not yeah. a degree program. Yeah, it's, it's not a degree program. So you don't get to put LLM at the end of your name insofar as that's useful to you. Um, you still pay $30,000 a year for it. So the tuition is very similar to an LLM program. Um, and, and it's, you know, I think otherwise pretty similar, um, you know, you get instruction. So it's just another way of doing it without having to self-study. And again, if that's something that you're interested in, you can do that. If you don't care about putting an LLM, you can do that. Although, I mean, it seems to be the same price as an LLM program anyway. So I'm not really sure why you wouldn't but you know it's 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 another option it is their kind of solution to the to the nca problem yeah there may be the opportunity to do single course enrollment um yeah. i'm not sure i'm not sure i know that there is an osgood as well like osgood will offer yes. single courses for like if you really need help with constitutional law you're just not making sense to you, you don't think you can self-study you can go to osgood in ontario and just sign up for the constitutional law course and they'll let you do that it's like it's not cheap, but it's it's a lot cheaper than taking an LLM program. So. Four thousand dollars per course. Yeah, but yeah. Um, you do need pre-approval from the NCA if you're looking to get credit for that course as an NCA subject. Okay, so you need pre-approval from the regulator. 
And for our MCA tutor courses, obviously you don't need pre-approval. Um, we're just teaching you how to how to prepare for the exam under the self-study route. So again, as, as Lauren said, it's, it's an option for if you want to do self-study, but you don't want to do it 100% alone, um, you know, we're the happy medium. Um, and the courses are a lot cheaper than $1,000 a course. Another thing we've left out in the discussion is networking opportunities. If you go through a law school, perhaps they will give you access to their network opportunities to find a job. And my experience, personal experience at UFT is that's not the case. Okay. They are only interested in placing their JD students. Their JD students is what ranks their law school amongst the other law schools. They don't rank LLM students. And Maybe they're starting to rank LLM programs according to who gets jobs. And that's why they have very strict requirements now at Osgood and UFT to only get people that have certain amount of years of professional experience, because those are the people that are going to get a job, right? A new grad with a master's program, you know, um, will have a hard time finding a job. But if I got this guy who's been a CEO of some company and is coming to do a master's program, I know he's going to get a job afterward. And then we could talk about, you know, the great statistics in our law school. So maybe, yes, you will have the opportunity to network because you're going to have other people in your class and that's fantastic. But there are other ways to do that. And Global Lawyers Canada is one of those ways to network, to meet people, to go to these types of events, to go to the in-person events as well. Um, and so you can definitely um, get those opportunities either through the LLM programs, which I'm certain you can find those networking opportunities, or through organizations like GLC.